Hello class, thank you for taking the time to watch this video. This is a video recording of chapter 8 of the Leading with Cultural Intelligence text by Mai Moa. As I mentioned in every single video tutorial or video lecture, I didn't create this. Um, all credit is due to the author of this text. In this last chapter that we're going to talk about in the MAN 4102 course is uh, the future of cultural intelligence. So the first concept that we come across is this notion of reframing, which is a very popular theme that comes up in the fields of social science and also in communication. And what reframing basically means is a communication technique in which an individual shifts or reinterprets old thought patterns to revise an outdated or limiting belief, idea, or perspective. So this is more of like a definition when it comes to looking at it from the macro lens. But if you're ever in a situation where someone's talking to you and you repeat and when you reply to them, you say, so what you're saying is blah, blah, blah. So when what you do there, it's very similar to paraphrasing, but in a verbal situation. Um, reframing is also used in that context, too, where you take um, ideas or communication or anything that's been passed along to you, and then you reframe it, and then you, pa you pass it back. Um, so it's just kind of like an acknowledgement for, uh, for the other person to understand what it is that you understood, if that makes sense. One of the areas that cultural intelligence can help us reframe is the changing demographics and environmental landscape we experience as a society. So again, looking at it from, from the macro lens now, which is coming um, not necessarily from the 101, but you know from like a, a dem demographer perspective, Something that we can understand is just taking the opportunity to learn about how, um, you know, there's different shifts in patterns and, for example, like migration patterns or maybe some legal patterns, cultural shifts, religious shifts that are taking place in certain societies. And that also helps us acquire, I guess, cultural intelligence points, right? Another theme that's discussed in this eighth chapter of the text is adaptive work. And adaptive work refers to an aspect of cultural intelligence that requires a change in values, beliefs, and behaviors to move through conflicting values held by different groups. It requires leaders to lead through conflicting values held by different groups and to eliminate the gap between the, val the values people have and the realities of their lives. Leaders are defined by their values, their beliefs, and their character, right? This also holds true maybe if you're not in a leadership position yet, but if you have someone who is in a position of leadership at your workplace, for example, right, you want them to lead by example, right? You don't want them to be like hypocrites or anything like that. So the things that you perceive from the leaders in your organization are things that people are going to hold you accountable for also when you're in that position of leadership too right so if you're if you can think about some of the values beliefs and characters of the people who are who hold leadership positions in your own organizations how's that going to shift when you become in a position of leadership People are also going to be evaluating your values, your beliefs, and your character to see if you, you know, if, if you're really meeting that, those expectations. To be culturally intelligent means that you must constantly review, revise, and reflect upon your personal value systems and how these systems impact your cultural interactions. So one of the things that I had you all do throughout this course is to prepare papers right and in a lot of these papers that you've been doing throughout these last couple of weeks sometimes it says like um you know what would you do if you were in a position of power right very few of you didn't really you know didn't really answer that and just 
dismissed the 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 idea by saying I'm not in a position of leadership, but so I don't know. But now is a good time for you all to be able to start thinking about these things, right? So the reason why I put you all on that spot is so that you can take what you're learning along the way and put yourself kind of like through a mock situation just to see what it is that you would do. So it's one thing to say that you're going to do something and then you know that when you're confronted with a certain situation, you're going to probably handle it a little differently, right? It's e easier said than done, as they say. Um, but still, for, for those of you who did answer the, the questions correctly, I think you did a phenomenal job, particularly with regards to like the sexual harassment um, and, you know, other types of discrimination, racial discrimination in, in the workplace. You know, what, what would you do? And a lot of you, it's a lot of you had mentioned, well, I would host trainings. That's something that came up very, very often in the papers that I read training um, is something that's important and and a, and a good chunk of you all also said that in addition to training that uh, that you would place a little bit more focus on the middle level managers and I thought that that was great because your middle level managers are the people who see the rest of the organization more often than someone in you know in in a leadership position for the most part right as a leader you don't really get to interact with all of the with the bulk of an organization that constitutes what the culture is all about right Th those are the people who are really the ones who are either adopting or not adopting your corporate or your organizational values and either driving them forward by acting on them or ignoring them and then creating a different a different culture that's different than what you had expected to have in your own organization. So if you value timeliness, for example, and your employees are getting to work late, you know, that just says that there's maybe an issue going on um, in in, uh, in the middle, from the middle manager level downward, right, that you want to be able to address. Interdependency. We live in an interdependent world. Our actions and choices know no boundaries. In the study of conflict analysis and resolution and also of, of um, sociology, social science, in, whenever, we see, whenever we see the word interdependency, we're thinking about it from a macro scale. So we always like to think of interdependency as the notion of like, for example, globalization, right? Maybe 50, 60, 70 years ago, there wasn't that much communication across nations or dependency for certain products, for example. But now we're living in a very interdependent world, as this slide is alluding to right here. And we kind of do depend on each other, right? We have some countries that are mass producers, right? And then some countries that are mass consumers. You can fill in um, the, the spots there and replace consumers and producers with whatever you know whatever countries you like and and you know that it's fact right not not everyone not, there is no one country that's like the master of all right that they can totally be without anything or without any you know without reaching out to any country for resources for um physical resources um, like, you know, minerals or petroleum or whatever it is, but pretty much across the world, we now depend on each other. So we're very interdependent. So that we depend on one another. To begin to see interdependence, culturally intelligent leaders need to be clear about their purpose in working with cultural groups, people, and processes. So if you can envision your organization, let's say you have like a hundred people right and you're able to you might not ever be able to do this but let's say that you make everyone stand like in a circle right and then you just kind of like draw some imaginary lines between people of that that symbolize kind of like interdependencies right people are going to be dependent on one another across departments within departments 
right even if you have satellite office maybe they maybe they depend on one another if you're in student services for example working for colleges or universities you need different departments right you need an admissions person a financial aid person you need uh, um, faculty members you also need academic advisors so then we're all interdependent on each other just to give you an example um, of for you as students there's a lot of different people who are um, responsible for your academic success so it's not just like you know, you, you come in through the door and you walk out with a degree. There's a lot of different people along the way that cultivate your experience. So that's the interde interdependency in the college and university setting, for example. If you, um, you know, for, for example, decide to take your education to graduate school and maybe if you live on campus or something like that, then you have even more people who are responsible for for that academic success and for that student engagement and all that. So there's a lot of interdependency that happens within organizations. And sometimes different, um, w whenever you have difference, d differences in needs and values with an emphasis on that value part, sometimes you get conflicts within an organization. So if you have employee from department A, employee from department B that need to work together, to hand off a customer from the beginning phase of a contract to the second phase of a contract. But for some reason, these two employees are not doing too well communicating with each other because one of one of the employees is very bubbly in personality and the other person is like me, that I just want to get straight to the point. Right. So what happens there is if there's differences in needs and values that other person may perceive me to be rude when in reality i'm thinking in terms of like lean six sigma process improvement right here i just want to get it over with i don't want a conversation with you i just want to i just want to take that customer move them across and then get ready for the next one because i have more people to talk to right um so then that's just kind of like a, a very off example, but still a applicable, I'd say, um, on how di differences right here, like even uh, in, in needs and values and also across cultural groups, across people, processes could cause um, conflicts among this channel of interdependency. Understanding and exploring your motivations, your passion, and your personal journey must serve as a foundation for reaching the desired vision to create cultural understanding and awareness. So this is all about you as a leader, a culturally intelligent leader, voicing your story so that the rest of your employees or the rest of your team or your colleagues can understand where you're coming from, how you see the world from your tower so that they can understand you know you, what what your passions are what motivates you your personal journey your viewpoints and also um, acknowledge that and respect you for a person as well consciousness consciousness basically means awareness of oneself including your thoughts your feelings and your situations uh, this awareness can also apply to a larger group such as a nation so like a cultural or national consciousness and then this also um, toys a little bit with this whole concept of cultural identity, national identity also. Through consciousness raising activities such as cultural intelligence, we have the opportunity to let go of, of our limiting thoughts and behaviors. So some of these consciousness raising activities, um, I wouldn't define cultural intelligence as an activity um, or at least I would not have. But if you have activities throughout the year for your staff, for example, like training, like sexual, um, the, the sexual harassment trainings, right? Or the racial discrimination trainings, just informing people about, you know, what's right and what's wrong, what's expected, what's not expected, you know, what, what the values of the organization are, and even trying to identify if you as a leader have these let's say five core values but if you channel that through the rest of the organization there may be something blocking your ability to get that vision and that mission out to the rest of the employees maybe it could be a manager that needs a little work with um, or maybe it could be some other reasons but um, this is one example of like a consciousness raising activity that you can use to 
carry forth um, this sense of conscious consciousness on the people who work with you. This consciousness creation is both the social and political force of the future. It's very deep. It is through this creation, a collective conscience, that creative forces will emerge and work through the chaos and complexity of our times. A return to the cultural labyrinth, and we've spoken about this labyrinth before. In cultural intelligence, leaders must be able to raise their levels of collective cultural consciousness by seeking out the challenges or our abyss. The abyss is not really a comfortable place to be, but it does serve as an opportunity to explore one's self-concept. Cultural intelligence provides leaders with a chance to expand their capacities to become better cross-cultural leaders. And last bullet here, um, in our cultural intelligence journey, we all return to, the, to our core, our home, and our center. If you truly do work that is culturally intelligent, work that is meaningful and intentional, then you will come to realize that differences in cultures promote a diversity of thinking, innovative practices, and ideas that take you out of mindlessness. And there's something that I think um, should be important to say here, that in a lot of different organizations, um, it'll kind of feel like talking about diversity is more like like macro groupthink, if if I can give kind of like an example. So like, for example, a lot of different organizations that I've worked for, in fact, all of them, I want to say they all they all say we value diversity. Right. But if you take a moment and step back and you you really ask yourself, are they just saying that because they know that they have to say it and because if they don't, that it raises a flag? Or do they really mean it, right? This is one of those situations where you can perceive the organization to be a person and just tell that person, actions speak louder than words. Let's see it. If you really value diversity, I want to see it, you know? How can how can you say that you value diversity and in three years of me being here, I've never seen a workshop on sexual harassment. I've never seen a workshop on training managers on how to not be biased whenever they see a resume. How do they not be discriminatory, right? What are some things that, that can be done um, during the interview process so that it can be an unbiased situation? Right. These are all things that you want to ask yourself to see if the organization that you're really working in truly does value the, the diversity or is it just something that they say because they know that other organizations are saying it. Right. An organization that is innovative, just like this slide is telling us right here, an organization that's innovative is an organization that embraces diversity and uses that as an asset, right? Because you, if you have a bunch of people in a room that they all live the same life, they've all had the same experience, how can you expect them to come up with innovative ways of reaching out to customers who are not like them, right? So like I said, organizations can use diversity as an asset, something that can be beneficial for everyone not not just in the organization because as interdependencies start to establish then they'll also value diversity right if the organization allows the platform for that to happen but the organization also benefits a lot when it's diverse right you get new ideas that come new thinking and even new levels of tolerance and acceptance so it's it's a great thing um so i challenge you to sit back and think in the organization that you work for, if you're currently employed, or any organization that you're affili affiliated with, have you heard them come sit, make a diversity statement, right? Have they ever said, we value diversity? And if they have, or if they have it written somewhere on a website or in an employee manual, ha have their actions spoken to that? Do you feel like they really do value diversity? And that's your extra credit. Send me an email and let me know about either an organization that you're working for or an organization that you're affiliated with. 
tell me whether or not you've heard them say that they value and appreciate diversity and let me know whether or not you feel like what they've done as an organization is it shows a commitment to diversity so that's your extra credit send me that and i'll give you a couple extra points on some exams all right in business culture's impact is to constantly test an organization's ability to be adaptable and flexible to be the best by letting go of old assumptions and biases it has always been the role of culture to help us let go of what we think we know and open our eyes to the responsibility we all have as leaders in shaping a better society <clears throat> and that's deep right there because it is the responsibility the expected the implied re responsibility of leaders to shape society right so we want the people who are in these positions of leadership to uh, be adaptable we keep talking about this concept of adaptability a cultural we know that a culturally intelligent leader adapts so what happens when a culturally well what happens when a leader doesn't adapt and they have a mindset that xyz is the right way of doing things and that's it because that's all i know that person is not really a culturally intelligent leader because there's some sort of egocentrism there, right? In not hearing other people's perspectives, not being sensitive to what other, what, what, how other people might view that way of doing things. So again, a culturally intelligent leader adapts and a leader is expected to help shape society. And this concludes the final PowerPoint presentation in this course. This is chapter eight from the Leading with Cultural Intelligence text by Maimoa. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, complaints, please feel free to reach out. I'll be more than happy to help. Thank you very much for watching this video and I look forward to reading your papers for this unit and to our discussion. Have a great day.